Erev Tov Chavrim. Good evening, my friends. I'm Stephen Ben Danun. You're watching Danun Institute of Biblical Research. And this evening, I'm going to reveal to you some things that are very shocking, some things that probably blow your mind completely. Um, I'm going to reveal to you this afternoon the proof of who is planning on building the third temple, the third temple in Israel. I'm going to show you just how evil and how demonic some of these things can be that are going to be happening in the not-so-distant future. And then you're going to understand exactly why, biblically, God has to send two witnesses to be able to thwart this very events that are going on. Because Israel is being duped, that is, the remnant of Israel will be duped into something if it isn't for the grace of God to intervene on their behalf. Of course, the political side of Israel, who's already fallen victim to Rome, doesn't really care. They have more in mind to burn incense unto other gods, as did uh, the house of Judah when they were captive in Egypt, that Jeremiah prophesied of many years ago, that God would bring them down if they didn't stop. But of course, they said they were better off and more financially better off by not heeding the words of Jeremiah and instead burning the incense into the other gods. And it's exactly what is happening today. The leaders of Israel are more happy with the financial gains that they can get out of selling the country off to the Vatican than they are for keeping the word of God in order to wait for the, com the promised coming Messiah that will redeem Israel from all of her troubles. Anyhow, let me take you directly into a book uh, here that I think it's very important for you to understand. These are the, uh, the, 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 it's called, it is the Royal Secret. Now, I cannot tell you the name of the book, but I will tell you that this is a very secretive book uh, that is used by a secret society. And that secret society is the Masons and the Knights of Templar. Uh, and you're going to find out what their intentions really are. And I'm bringing this out because it's important for you to know exactly that you're going to see history as being repeated once again in the very near future here. Uh, on one particular page here it says, To the Magi, by the consecrated star of initiation, came to rend asunder the worn veil of the old temple in order to give the church a new tissue of legends and symbols that still and ever conceals from the profane and ever perverse to the elect the same truths. And by the way, what they're going into on this particular issue here is their show, the, the Magi, they consider to be magicians. They consider that they had actually learned some of the great secrets of Egypt. Now, and I'll bring these things out to you later in another video, but I'm just really wanting to show you some of the, uh, the, the association directly with the Roman Catholic Church in these particular organizations, which the Catholic Church officially denounces. Uh, dropping down a little bit further, it says, The Gnostics caused the Gnosis to be prescribed by Christians, and the official sanctuary was closed against the high initiation. Thus, the hierarchy of knowledge was uh, compromised by the violences of uprising, ignorance, and disorders of the sanctuary are reported in the state. For always, listen to this, for always, willing or unwillingly, the king is sustained by the priest. Did, did, can you believe that? Willingly or unwillingly, the king is sustained by the priest. And this is the Roman Catholic priest, okay? Now, and it is from the eternal sanctuary of the divine instruction that, that the powers of the earth to ensure themselves durability must receive their consecration and their force. The harmonetic science of the early Christian ages, cultivated also by Geber, Alphrabius, and others of the Arabs studied by the chiefs of Templar, the embodied in certain symbols of the higher degrees of Freemasonry, may be accurately defined as the Kabbalah in the active real realization of the magic of works. It has the three analogs, degrees, religious, philo philosophical, and physical realization. Now, I'm going to share with you here also in a few moments here um, a little footage from a documentary that I had seen years ago. And it's very evident in this documentary, the little footage that you're going to get to see here, that the, 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 the um, 
the researcher here is definitely a, a, is of the Jesuit order, he, whether he's a Mason or whatever the case may be. But Rome is trying to figure out the secrets that the ancient, um, the ancient uh, Egyptian um, um, priest knew. You have to remember, the roots of the Vatican comes from ancient Egypt. A lot of people are not aware of that, but it does. As I've talked to you many times before, connecting it scripturally through Hadad. Hadad, who was of Esau's descendants, he was the only one of the royal house of Esau that escaped David's sword, made it into Egypt and was raised by the Pharaoh of Egypt. This is where he learned the sun god worship. You know, this is where actually you're... The Gregorian calendar, I don't want to say your, because I know a lot of you guys, they don't, you don't like that either. But the Gregorian calendar, the very calendar used today, has all of these pagan symbols in there, such as Sunday, and S-U-N-D-A-Y. It is for the sun god worship. Then you have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, etc. Even the months are all based on uh, pagan gods. So it's, it's troublesome, no doubt, but it's truthful. And, um, and, and we're gonna, I want to really start taking you very deep into some of these things here so you can understand the secret workings in behind the scenes here. Uh, another one that I want to share with you, and this here also is going to be a disturbing for you because there's many Christians out there that are waiting for the building of the third temple. Now, I've always taught that the third temple, although it may seem to be a righteous thing, is not going to be righteous. This is not the temple of Ezekiel 39, where God commands the temple to be built, the temple that is brought down out of heaven, as in the book of Revelation. This third temple that will be built is going to be built for the Pope of Rome, although they have put together a priesthood. Now, I'm not speaking like in the case of Gershon Solomon over the Temple Institute and faithful uh, land and Israel faithful movement. He's a genuine man of God that really loves the Lord. But it's interesting how that he's been held back. I think that he's had even infiltrators that have helped hold him back so that he cannot progress forward. And the movement that he has started years ago has slowly but surely dwindled out. Because even God knows that this temple that's coming it's not going to be of God. It's going to be a very satanic movement. This is one of the reasons why they need the United Nations forces or a coalition force in Israel. It's one of the reasons why you will see Israel defeated in a battle. And it will take a, a unilateral force to come in to restore peace. It will also allow the, the allies to take lands that are rich in oil. Even Greece was recently talking about doing some military, military training exercises with Israel and with Egypt and with some other nations there. Why? Because they're in a dispute over the oil-rich areas of one of the islands there that Turkey lays claim to as well. So everything is about oil as far as the nations are concerned. But as far as the Pope of Rome is concerned, everything is about Jerusalem and him having full control and sovereignty, so, sovereignty over this area. Now there's many that say, no, we believe the Pope of Rome is only the false prophet. I don't believe, they say, I don't believe that he's the Antichrist. And I've proven quite satisfactorily that he is the Antichrist, and yet he is the false prophet as well. You have to remember, if, you, if, you, if God is, a, if there is a, uh, I don't like using the word Trinity, and a lot of people get angry because I don't like using it, but I do know that there is God, there is a Father God, and there is the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know that He gave the Holy Spirit for His believers to live in us, which is a portion of God's own Spirit. So God is a triune uh, entity. And so Satan mimicking God has done the exact same thing. The false prophet and the Antichrist are one and the same man. But you have to remember, there is, a, there is a demonic spirit that actually incarnates Satan, just like he did with Judas Issachariot. Okay? Now, that being said, the thing is, is some people question whether or not the Pope actually has the influence on building the temple and have even challenged me on that. But I'm going to read to you exactly what their intentions are. Now, if you noticed earlier, even the word Kabbalah, 
was involved in the Freemason and the Knights of Templar, who are nothing but Vatican agents, just like Jesuits, one of the secret societies. And they have, as you know, all the way up to the 33rd degree Mason there. And I know all of their doctrines and all of their beliefs, every bit of it. I know exactly what they're taught and what they believe. Now I'm going to share with you another thing that they have and what their intentions here. Now, let me start right here. The Templars, whose history is so imperfectly known, were those terrible uh, conspirators in 118, or 1118, nine knights crusaders in the east, among whom were Geoffrey uh, de saint Omer and Hughes de, de, de Payens, and I may not pronounce these names right, forgive me, I'm not very good with words like that, consecrated themselves to religion and took an oath between the hands of Patriarch and Constantinople as see always secretly or openly hostile to that uh, of Rome from time of uh, Photius. The, the avowed object, object of the Templars was to protect the Christians who came to visit the holy places. Interesting, isn't it? Their secret object was the rebuilding of the Temple of Solomon on the model prophesied by Ezekiel. Well, what do you know? They're trying to bring prophecy to pass. This rebuilding, formerly predicted by the Judaizing mystics of the early ages, had become the secret dream of the patriarchs of the Orient. You see, they talk about the Judaizers because they hate the Jewish believers, the true remnant of Israel, wanting to see Ezekiel 39's temples uh, rebuilt, Solomon's temple. But these guys here are planning on doing it themselves. That's why it says this rebuilding formally predicted, excuse me, where they say here, excuse me, the Christians who came to visit the holy places, these secret obje obje object was the rebuilding of the Temple of Solomon on the model prophesied by Ezekiel. Oh, I'm sorry, let me back up again a little bit. The avowed object of the Templars was to protect the Christians who came to visit the holy places. So the Knights of Templar are the one that have worked with Rome to ensure that the Vatican takes control of all the holy sites in Israel. And of course, Israel has given them all those places, including Mount Zion. And this has been a plan for almost 800, 900 years. This has been their plan to do. This rebuilding formally predicted by the Judaizing mystics of earlier ages. See, they, they downed the Jews. My Jewish brethren, my Jewish rabbi brethren, wake up to what they are trying to do to you. If there is any Jew involved in the bringing about a third temple right now that is involved with this order, that is involved with the Catholic Church in doing so, it is not of God. This has been a secret sect that has been planning on doing this for hundreds and hundreds of years now. And I'm revealing it to you from their own writings. So he says here, the Temple of Solomon, rebuilt and consecrated to the Catholic worship, would become, in effect, the metropolis, metropolis of the universe. You see what they're planning on rebuilding this temple for? This is not being rebuilt for the Jews. This is being rebuilt for the Catholic worship. It's being rebuilt for the Pope of Rome. And they have dedicated themselves to making this objective an accomplished work and an accomplished feat. Mm. The Templars of poor fellow solidarity of the Holy House of the Temple intend to to be rebuilt, took as their models in the Bible, the warrior masons of Zorobabel, who worked holding the sword in one hand and the trowel in the other. Therefore, it was that that sword and trowel were the insignia of the Templars, who subsequently, as will be seen, concealed themselves under the name of Brethren Masons. Let me just, let me, t let me remind you real quick what they're planning on doing again. This rebuilding formally predicted by Judaizing mystics of early ages, had become the secret dream of the patriarchs of the Orient. The Temple of Solomon, rebuilt and consecrated to the Catholic worship, would become, in effect, the metropolis of the universe. 
You know, what's interesting is I've been teaching this for quite some time. That the Vatican fully intends taking Jerusalem. They fully intend on building a third temple, what they will call Solomon's Temple. And it's funny, the Turkish prime minister actually called it not long ago, said it called for the building of Solomon's Temple. Why? He lets you know he's a, he's a mason as well. Anywhere and everywhere where you see people calling for the building of the third temple with the Vatican's involvement or the Knights of Templar or the Masons or the Jesuits, it is all demonic and straight out of hell. It is not the temple of Ezekiel 39, although they say they're going to build it after this model. My Jewish brethren, you need to wake up, but let me tell you what's going to happen. This is the reason why I brought out the other part here just a few moments ago about their, them getting into the, the secret uh, mystic circles and stuff like that, wanting to know the secrets of Egypt. Real quick, let's look at that clip, then we'll continue on. of the ancients, through an ingenious reinterpretation of the evidence, Shwala recreated a model of ancient Egypt that resurrects the ancient secrets for modern eyes. Understanding the mentality of the ancient world through the decoding lens of symbolism, Shwala showed the Egyptians were not the superstitious savages modern Western academic thought holds them to have been. Instead, he showed example after example of high wisdom and accomplishment not only equaling that of modern science, but in some instances far surpassing modern abilities. Evidence of those of that earlier civilization, and until or unless the water weathering of the Sphinx is adequ adequately explained within the context of accepted um, chronology of ancient Egypt, it remains a thorn in the side of orthodoxy, because until it is explained, it seems to suggest that, or very strongly suggests, that the Sphinx was there prior to those catastrophic events. You see, they, 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 they study furiously. They know that there are symbols and signs that were left there by the Egyptian priest and that they want to know the magic of that. They even believe that Moses did what he did by magic. They say because Moses was able to teach the Egyptians wisdom. It wasn't magic that Moses did what he did. It was the hand of Almighty God. And it wasn't until the priests were covered in boils. Once they were covered in boils. See, God knew what plague to bring to break those priests where he could break that, that demonic spell that was on them. Even there's another part in this film here where the... Um, where the uh, archaeologist speaks about the Sphinx, and he, he actually s s perfectly proves that the Sphinx came from a time before uh, the Great Deluge, which would have been the Flood. He proves it by water erosion on the, on the base of the Sphinx. Well, that was because of the Flood. And, of course, he was looking for someone that had a legitimate reason why there would be moisture, water, in, that, in, in a climate that was considered nothing but a desert. That was during the Great Deluge. And, of course, it could have been a tropical paradise before the flood came in that particular part of the world. Nonetheless, the Sphinx that was built there was done by the civilization beforehand. God had to destroy the world at that time, just like God destroyed the Tower of Babel. Why did he destroy the Tower of Babel? Well, notice the city was built with bricks. They were making bricks to build the city, but this tower that could reach up into heaven had nothing to do with being built by bricks. I believe that they were doing, they were getting into mysticism and magical powers and were trying to figure out how to cross into another dimension, into heaven itself. This was the Tower of Babel. Just like it was before the flood, God had to destroy the world because of the fallen angels and all the great things that they had learned then and what they were capable of doing. And then the Egyptians trying to dig up there to, to discover what was going on then had also got into a, a, a mystical type of thing. They were able to turn the water to blood just as Moses smote the river with his rod, showing that Christ would be smitten and that blood would come from his side. The waters of life would come through the blood. 
That's a little off the subject, I realize that. But what, the reason I'm getting to this is because Moses and Aaron were faced with, 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 peop, with, with, with priests of their day that, were, that did great signs and wonders. And this is what we are prophesied about in the New Testament. The Christian Bible prophesies of the, 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 the Antichrist, the false prophet, doing great signs and wonders. And no doubt he will, because why? They have been working feverishly for hundreds of years to break the code that was, that was in Egypt, to know how to do these, these, these secret magical things. And it's written right in their own writings. They go deep into this. I mean, it's deeper than anything I've ever heard in my life. But God will raise Moses up and bring him back. Now, I know there's a lot of people believe Enoch. They say, well, Enoch never tasted death and he's got to die. Well, the Bible also says that there is a group that won't taste death that'll meet those which are uh, uh, the, uh, the, those that are alive uh, will, will not be, see death, but they will meet uh, those that have been raised up from the dead and meet the Lord in the air. What about them? Do they have to die? Of course not. It's, a, it's ludicrous to even suggest that. So the idea, if you look back at what the scripture says, it is appointed once to man to die. Look at that Greek word. It's not an absolute. And that's what I find interesting. I wrote about that one time. It's not an absolute. I went into that Greek word just to see. It's just saying that, in other words, you will come to this time. But it doesn't mean you have to die. So the idea of Enoch coming back, it actually contradicts the word of God. Because one, the two witnesses of Revelation 11, they have the gift of Elijah and, and the gift of Moses. Turning the water to blood, bringing down fire. It devours their enemies. That's what Elijah did. Turn, uh, uh, closing up the heavens that it rained not in the days of their ministry. That's what Elijah did. Turning the water to the blood. That's what Moses did. But there's more importantly, there's several scriptures that Moses has never fulfilled that God prophesied to him that he would fulfill. And that's something that I'd like to share with you. Let me take you to... Uh, well, let me, first I'll just, I'm going to mention a couple of those. One is Exodus... Where, 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 he's, where God says to Moses in Exodus chapter 3, I believe it is, he said, if they don't believe the voice of the first sign, they shall believe the voice of the latter sign. So in this case, Moses has two voices, a first sign and a latter sign. Now, we know that there was a remnant of Israel that believed continually. But in case of when Moses first came, God clearly says, they did not believe Moses. In fact, God had to kill all the original people off and only the children made it in. So they did not believe Moses. Every single one except Caleb and Joshua died in the wilderness. And God raised up the children and brought them into the land. And even many of them ended up dying because of unbelief. So God says to Moses, if they don't believe the voice of the first sign, this is after he does the physical sign, turning his hand to leprosy and restoring that, and the, the, his staff to a serpent, and the staff returning back to, to that, God does those two miracles, and that was to show the children of Israel that he was truly sent from God. But then God says to him, if they don't believe the voice of the first sign, and that's kind of interesting, God says, if they don't believe you this time, in other words, they shall believe the voice of the latter sign. The latter sign is for the latter days. That's when Israel will believe in this particular time frame when Moses returns. Also, Moses says in Exodus 15, I will sing unto the Lord that I have gotten victory over the horse and over his rider. That is speaking of the Antichrist. The Antichrist in Revelation that rides the horse there that comes in on the white horse. Of course, that same Antichrist spirit rides all four horses. Doesn't mean there's four Antichrists, does it? Nor is there four false prophets. But the same rider changes horses is all. Now, of course, Moses, it puts it in the future. Even Rashi, the great, uh, uh, the, the Midrash mostly has written about his own uh, commentaries on the Torah, says that undoubtedly Moses will be back in the future, perhaps in the Messianic age. And he's quoting the sages before him. And yes, Moses does return. And it's not over, because you have to remember, at the Red Sea, there were 600 horses and, and chariot riders that were destroyed in that sea, not one. But Moses sings about victory over one horse and one rider. And that's the Antichrist at the end of the age, the horse rider of Revelation that he is faced with there. That's the one that he overcomes. 
And then if it doesn't beat all else, God gives another prophecy to Moses that is bewildering to say the least. In Exodus 34, verse 10, and he said, Behold, I make a covenant. This is God himself making a covenant. You have to remember, God's about to take Moses off the face of the earth at this time. Before all thy people, I will do marvels. Actually, in Hebrew, the word rightly translated as wonders. And do you know that the Jewish rabbis even changed the word in some of our modern English versions to, to, to a lesser meaning? Because, and they even say why. They say we changed it because... Moses never did anything greater than what was in Egypt. So it must have not have been referring to, 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 to Moses doing something. How absurd. God says, I'll make a covenant before all thy people, and I will do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth. Are you serious? The parting of the Red Sea, all the great wonders, the hail falling, the plagues and everything that happened in Egypt. And now God is saying he's going to make a covenant. He says, before all thy people, I will do marvels, which will be Israel. Before Israel, he's going to do these marvels such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation. And all the people among which thou art shall see the work of the Lord. All the people will see this. All the nations will be able to see it. You're going to need a modern day to be able to see that event take place. You're going to need television. You're going to need CNN. You're going to need Fox News, Newsmax. You're going to need uh, Israel National News. You're going to need Arush Sheva, Channel 10, and Channel 2 News. You're going to need Al Jazeera and a whole bunch of others and TASS and Moscow Times. They love to report on these things. They all have correspondence in Israel. And by the way, they'll have even more correspondence. Why? Because the Pope of Rome will have built his little temple over there, Solomon's Temple, claiming that it's the third temple that is being built there to bring about all nations and it's a house of prayer. It's not. It's a Catholic place of worship. That's what they have in their own writing. Hmm. Angers me to see that nor in any nation, and all the people among which thou art shall see the work of the Lord. For it is a terrible thing that I will do with thee. God didn't say he's going to do it with Enoch. And it's not going to be Enoch and Moses. Don't get that twisted up either. It will be Moses himself. God says, I will do a terrible thing with thee. After that, after God prophesied that right there, God didn't do anything else with Moses. Nothing. Nothing, nothing of, of, of greatness that he did in Egypt. So you see, the thing is, is Elijah and Moses are going to face the Vatican and their magicians. And believe me, they will do great signs and they will do great wonders. But God will prevail. Oh, they might think, just like it was with Jesus when they killed Jesus. You know, Rome actually killed Jesus too. But when they killed, when they killed Jesus, Satan thought he won. And when they kill, they rise up and kill these two witnesses. And they can't kill them until the ministry is finished. But when they do kill them, they think they got a victory again. In fact, the Bible says they send gifts one to another. Why? Because you know what? They think the Pope of Rome is the true, the true Messiah. Not the remnant of Israel, they don't. They came out. They recognize that Jesus Christ is God. But there's a whole world, whole world that fell for this. See, the Pope of Rome will look like he's a great man when he comes in there and tries to stop the sacrifice and oblation. Because see, Israel will be trying to offer their sacrifices in there. And he'll put a stop to it. And the, and the, and the Christian world will say, Oh, that's a great thing. Look what the Pope did. Oh, he did a great thing because he won't allow the sacrifice when Jesus was the greatest sacrifice. Yeah. He'll look like a great man, won't he? But Moses and Elijah will stand up against him. Then the world will hear the true gospel. You know, Jesus himself made that comment in Matthew 24. When this gospel, this evangelie, is preached to all the world, then the end will come. That will be the true 
gospel. When your two witnesses are here, Jesus even said about Elijah, truly he shall first come and restore all things. There won't be nothing left out then. I'm sorry about getting a little excited and maybe I shouldn't apologize for that. I know some people say, you know, Red Steve, I wish you wouldn't scream, but you know, there's some things I get passionate about and I just, I, you know, I've got to say what I feel. Because we're living in a passionate time. And God is not going to play church at all. Let me share a couple other things with you real quick in closing. He says in Jeremiah 49, 17, Also Edom shall be a desolation. Everyone that goeth by it shall be astonished and shall hiss at all the plagues thereof. That's why God says in Revelation 18, 4, in the, in the New Testament, the Christian Bible there, He says, Come out of her, my people, and be not partakers of her plagues. Christian friends, Jewish brethren, rabbis, come out of her. There's a lot of Catholic people that are going to masses that really want to serve God. Come out of her. God's got some people in there that are still His. Come out of her. And you know, I see some of the beautiful testimonies in our comments on Facebook. People saying, I was Catholic. Your video today has helped me and I have left. Email us those testimonies. We'd love to see them. Stephen Benoon at AOL.com. One more verse here. Many of them. Obadiah. Some people say, how do you know that Esau and, uh, or, or Rome is, is, is Esau and, and all that stuff? Obadiah. One chapter in the only book in there. Start with verse 7. He names Esau and then he blames Esau for destroying Israel in 70 A.D. That was Rome. These are the descendants of Esau. That's who's in Rome. You know what's funny? The Pope of Rome, Pope Francis, his own parents are Italian. They are descendants of Esau. That doesn't mean if you're a descendant of Esau, God can't save you. God would love to save anyone that's willing to be saved. Jeremiah 50 Verse 13, because of the wrath of the Lord, it shall not be inhabited, but it shall be wholly desolate. Everyone that goeth by Babylon shall be astonished and hiss at all our plagues. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching the New Institute of Biblical Research. I hope this is a blessing. Remember, I'll, I'll say it in closing. Let me just read it one more time. This rebuilding... Then he put a comma, formerly predicted by Judaizing mystics. So my Jewish brethren, now you know what Rome thinks about you. They just consider you a bunch of Judaizing mystics of earlier ages. Had, another comma, had become the secret dream of the patriarchs of the Orient. Period. The Temple of Solomon, comma, rebuilt and consecrated to the Catholic worship would become, in effect, the metropolis of the universe. Yeah, they're going to help you build a third temple for the Catholic Church. I'm Stephen Denoon with the Denoon Institute of Biblical Research. One final word I'd like to uh, <clears throat> bring to your attention as well. We do need your support. We thank you for, for being a part of this ministry. It is vital what we're doing. Uh, we are touring through Europe right now to different Holocaust sites to try to bring those uh, video and document that information there. There are some other things that we're documenting as well. I can't really say what that is. But uh, quite extensively, we're, we're, we're going out and getting information that we feel that is very important to you. So we just ask you to remember us in your giving. And God bless you. Thank you very much.